Hi, I'm uh, Keith Bergelt. I want to uh, thank any, everyone for joining that uh, was able to join today. And uh, today we'll be talking about the management of patent risk in open source software, particularly focused on, open, on banking and financial services. Uh, I want to thank the uh, Finos and, uh, and the LF for the opportunity to present today and to be able to talk about uh, how Open Invention Network is working to be able to support freedom of action, freedom to operate, and increase the level of comfort that uh, banking and financial services companies in particular uh, feel in uh, adopting open source uh, code uh, and uh, the, uh, the making good choices about, about innovative technologies that come out of uh, various projects uh, from uh, the LF and, uh, and other organizations aware that are producing active code. Uh, I think it's probably no secret for anyone who uh, has been active in the open source world for some time that every electronic touch that we have today uh, is uh, Linux op and, and or open source software enabled. And uh, you, uh, even if you're utilizing a uh, iOS platform, uh, the uh, even though it doesn't run on the Linux kernel, uh, there's a significant amount of open source and Linux code that's in uh, in that's running the iOS platform. But obviously, Amazon services, Google searches, and pretty much every search platform that exists is utilizing open source. The lights that we cross at, the uh, air traffic control systems that we rely on when uh, when we're flying. Uh, it, every social media platform, whether it's uh, in, in Asia, based in Asia, or, uh, or in the US, uh, is, or in Europe, is running on open source software. Every ATM transaction that we have, every mobile payments transaction in China, uh, or wherever else in the world, we're utilizing that uh, functionality. Uh, the autonomous driving platforms that are being developed, whether it be by Daimler, or by the Apollo platform of Baidu or uh, anyone else in the world. Those platforms are being developed in open source. Chromebooks, Android obviously are fundamental uh, open source platforms uh, that are built on top of the kernel. And so it's all around us in a way that, uh, that uh, few people uh, that are uh, general consumers that are not in the industry would truly understand. Um, uh, while open source and Linux are not particularly well branded in products, uh, they are nonetheless uh, uh, the engines, the platforms that drive uh, innovation uh, and rapid cycle times and uh, a level of uh, inventiveness uh, that would not be possible without the whole idea of collaborative development. I think, you know, we obviously see that over the last uh, 15 years in particular, uh, software has become something that everyone kind of aspires to incorporate in their products to make them more useful, more beneficial to users uh, and to allow the, the products to be uh, more functional. And uh, very few companies five years from now will be defining themselves as, uh, as hardware companies. Um, we look at uh, the adoption of open source at companies like Komatsu, John Deere, uh, uh, machine, machining companies from Germany, Japan, elsewhere in the world, uh, uh, companies that uh, make uh, lighting equipment, uh, companies that make uh, video equipment, uh, uh, all manner of companies across the world, whether they be companies that have lived and been very much identified with hardware uh, or companies that have grown as software are increasingly increasing the software centricity in their products. And again, uh, no longer defining themselves by hardware, but rather by software. Uh, the, uh, the nature of how this this works and how the open source community works is so important to the output that we get. Um, the modality of open source, the idea that, that people come together, collaborate and produce something that would otherwise not have been possible to produce a level of innovativeness and inventiveness 
that's otherwise not possible through siloed invention, I think is where the true power of open source is because at some level, it's, an, it's a social movement. It just happens to produce uh, technology and code that can be used and reused by literally millions of companies around the world, million of entities around the world. Um, but the reality is that this, this social movement is, is so impactful that it's truly transformative because one plus one plus one doesn't equal three, it equals six or 10 or 20 when we bring smart people together and allow them to engage around uh, uh, technical challenges. Uh, and with this, we get more diversity. Uh, we get uh, people from all around the world. It's, it's not race dependent or religion dependent or geographically dependent. You don't have to come to Silicon Valley as you did during the, the dot-com era uh, of, the, uh, of the, the 90s to be able to participate in, uh, in, in open source. You can participate in situ from wherever you find yourself in the world and not just during COVID, but anytime. Uh, and that's part of this great melting pot of individual capabilities and, and, uh, and competence to be able to create this new novelty that's so valuable to the products that we come to rely on and the services that we use. So uh, what we ultimately get are high le higher levels of innovation. Um, and we do it through, this isn't talked about a lot as a concept, but uh, for me, when, when I think 12 years ago, I first had a conversation with Jim Zemlin about the notion of, uh, of really project-based innovation, project-based collaboration, that projects were increasingly, in his view, going to become uh, the foundation for innovative platforms. Uh, and so as a result, um, at that point, Linux was, was clearly the, the main charge of Jim Zemlin and the others at the Linux Foundation at that time. Uh, but since then, we've seen all manner of, of uh, innovative projects rise up, literally hundreds of projects managed just by the LF, uh, the networking projects like OPNFV and ONAP, uh, Open Daylight, uh, the Virtualization Alliance, uh, uh, the uh, RISC-V open hardware project, which is the RISC-V uh, uh, international, which is based in, uh, in Switzerland, automotive grade Linux, uh, developing the digital DNA of vehicles out into the future. Um, and uh, not just supporting uh, what we have in the cabin of the vehicle, uh, but uh, ultimately supporting all mission critical functionality on a, on a Linux-based platform. Hyperledger uh, that supports the, the development of ledgering technology uh, and blockchain to be able to support uh, lower fraud in, in bank banking and financial services, but also uh, many, many other applications for, uh, for this, uh, the code that's coming out of Hyperledger, the Open Container Initiative. There's so many projects that are producing incredibly uh, uh, significant amounts of code. Uh, and uh, we think about Kubernetes and uh, it's clearly one of the most uh, uh, significant uh, innovations in terms of uh, containers over the last, uh, last 10 years. Uh, and so a lot of things were talked about that, that really have in the, in the 90s and 97 actually that, that really are brought to bear in the uh, in the in the modern era of uh, where open source is uh, is becoming so uh, so significant and proliferating at such a high rate across many many different sectors, is that the idea of coopetition it's it's very much part and parcel of what open source is about. We cooperate cross organizationally, cross culturally, uh, 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 cross geography to be able to create something different, to be able to innovate at a higher level. And then the core code that comes out of that innovation process is then available to be used and reused, adopted uh, by anyone who chooses to do so, so long as they adhere to the rules associated with the individual uh, uh, licenses that uh, the code is actually produced under. And so it's a, it's a very, uh, um, elegant way of, uh, of partnering and collaborating uh, that allows us to kind of get to a realization of a notion that was discussed 
um, in the in the 90s and really comes out of game theory, the idea that we cooperate to compete more effectively. Uh, and it's really never been more uh, uh, prominently featured than through the open source platforms that we currently use and through open source project collaboration. Um, I think a lot of people look at open source and they think, uh, especially people who are new to it, think that it represents some kind of uh, departure from traditional innovation associated with uh, uh associated with inventive activities and codification of those inventions uh, i think what we see from many 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 companies some of the largest patent holding companies in the world are some of the uh, greatest participants in terms of number of projects they partic participate in the number the amount of code that they contribute back uh the amount of code that they incorporate in their products uh, and uh, they also are some of the, as I said, some of the largest patent holders in the world. And so this duality that that's really designed into their existence is something that I think many in, in new in new industries or segments or sectors that are just beginning to adopt open source code and understand um, it is a community activity. It's a it's something that that, that ties to opportunity, great opportunity for innovation. Uh, to reduce cost and to be accelerate innovation, while at the same time, it also provides some obligations. And those obligations are usually around comportment, how we behave, how we utilize, uh, how we comply with license requirements and how we uh, create governance programs inside our companies to also how we support the use of patents, what is appropriate in terms of how patents are used. Uh, the basic concept that OIN has promulgated is that uh, where we collaborate, where we rely on each other to produce core, to where we want to be able to use and build on core code and build on each other's ideas, we shouldn't be suing each other. Uh, if we want to maintain patents that uh, create differentiation and support innovation, and that's what you know, there's so much diversity in the community. Some companies are incredibly supportive of the patent system. Some companies not. Whatever flavor of approach you take, whatever predisposition you have, uh, there is very much room for this duality of open and closed to exist and open and proprietary to exist. And so um, this form of practice duality is something that more and more companies are coming to and recognizing that uh, that community solutions for patent risk mitigation exist, like OIN, but also there's an obligation and responsibility to be able to support kind of defending yourself uh, through the relationships you form with multi-party entities like OIN and what you do independently, whether it's making pledges or promises of patents that you have, like Red Hat has done, dating back now almost 20 years. Uh, uh, Microsoft is, or sorry, Mike, uh, IBM has done, dating back 15 years, and many, many other companies uh, have uh, have expressed kind of an independent leadership uh, and a uh, sense of responsibility to the community by by uh, articulating uh, uh, a uh, a pledge or a promise or a, a, a mode of of conduct that they're uh, committing themselves to related to their patent portfolio. There are many different. Uh, uh, patent non-aggression initiatives, uh, defensive patent management organizations. OIN is the first and the oldest. It's uh, just uh, reaching its 15th year uh, in operation. Uh, but you have Allied Security Trust, which is an anti-troll mechanism. RPX, which largely uh, uh, is a is an anti-troll activity as well. Unified Patents, which uh, allows poor quality patents that have been already been granted to be attacked and to be uh, uh, invalidated. Uh, and then Lot Network, which is the newest of these entities, which started about six years ago uh, and has actually had incredible growth uh, in and is focused on anti-privateering uh, to prevent companies from conveying patents to third parties uh, and having those third parties then sue uh, a plethora of other companies. And so, that's a community that's now, I think, a thousand members and uh, quite significant in terms of reducing risk. These are all complementary programs for the most part. Uh, and OIN established, as I said, 15 years ago in, OI, in 05, 
uh, with the original six companies, IBM, Red Hat, at that time, Novell, but now Suse, Philips, Sony, and NEC. And then Google and Toyota uh, joined uh, a bit later in this decade to uh, support uh, projects and platforms that they are, uh, they are very much responsible for advancing, uh, whether it be Chrome or Android, or in the case of Toyota, automotive grade Linux. Um, OAN has <clears throat> 3,300 companies that are participating in its community. They own over 3 million patents and applications worldwide that are subject to the cross license. Uh, <clears throat> our portfolio of owned patents is 1,300. Uh, these are patents that read on many different uh, uh, technologies and provide clearance uh, for companies and projects uh, as, uh, as more and more open source code is adopted. Uh, and we've spent over $100 million acquiring uh, defensive patents, some of which we've conveyed to companies <clears throat> or forward deployed to them to allow them to, uh, <clears throat> to manage risk more effectively. Uh, and uh, we've uh, um, essentially served as a warehouse of patents that read on companies that uh, were, had set themselves up as patent aggressors. I think it's no secret that OIN, one of the major motivating factors 15 years ago for the formation of OIN was the, the rhetoric and the, uh, uh, the aggressive uh, behaviors of uh, Microsoft as a monolithic threat. I think threat has morphed dramatically. Uh, those of you who have been uh, observing will see that Microsoft is now a member of OIN uh, for the last two years, almost two years to the day. It's been a participant in our community and, uh, and a participant in many other communities such as Linux Foundation and others and has been very, very active in supporting open source uh, and, uh, and has become a, a so uh, an entity that recognizes exactly what I described earlier, uh, the twin elements of opportunity and obligation. And it has uh, been working very hard uh, with OIN on some of the projects we're involved in to reduce risk from patents, uh, as well as with GitHub and, and other ventures to be able to show uh, that it is willing to and ready to meet uh, its obligations. So, uh, so OIN is really piv is pivoting and I'll talk more about that pivot in a little while, but uh, as a result of Microsoft's participation and a result, as a result of the, uh, the participation and the reliance uh, and the recognition of interdependence that so many companies, so many operating companies have formed uh, um, and the connection that they now have with, uh, with open source, which makes uh, uh, the, the potential of, uh, of risk associated with operating companies uh, to open source uh, lower, um, but uh, but not not non-existent, and so uh, we uh, we have developed a model where companies agree through the OAN cross license that where they own patents that read on core open source functionality, uh, core Linux functionality that they won't use those patents to sue and that they will share those patents through, through a cross license which OIN manages. And that's essentially the Linux system. Uh, and I'll talk again more about that in a, in a little bit. Uh, the, just to give you a sense of the fact that very, in a very purposeful way, uh, OIN is a global organization. It is, uh, uh, Largely, if we look at the largest percentage, it's, it's in, East, in Europe, Middle East Africa. Uh, the US is obviously very significant, but quite importantly, Asia Pacific represents 22%. Uh, percent. Uh, actually, it's a little bit more than that now. It's almost 24% of our, uh, our total uh, community membership of 3,300 companies. Uh, and so, uh, as I said, uh, Asia Pacific is at 23% actually. Um, South and Central America at 18%, which is also very important to us to ensure that the, uh, the uptake of, uh, by companies, uh, by governments in, of open source in Latin America is recognized by having representation from companies uh, from Argentina, 
uh, Chile, uh, Peru, uh, Brazil, obviously, and, and many others. Uh, North America represents 24% and Europe, Middle East, Africa, 35%. Uh, we like this kind of mix and we hope that Asia Pacific and, and Latin America continue to rise in terms of percentage as more and more companies come to open source and come to rely on it and come to participate in open source projects. Uh, this is just a representative sample of some of the community participants from different sectors, uh, some of the most sophisticated network telecom companies and the networking and telecom companies in the world. Uh, Rakuten and Geo are two of the, the, the most modern 5G networks to be launched. Uh, uh, one in Geo is in India, Rakuten in Japan. Uh, AT&T, obviously uh, a driving force uh, behind uh, open source uh, op adoption and uh, technology development uh, through its active participation uh, and support for ONAP, OPNFV, Open Daylight, and other of the networking projects the Linux Foundation manages. Uh, you know, most some of the, the most significant internet companies in the world, uh, Alibaba, Baidu, Tencent, uh, uh, Huawei. Uh, these are an incredible group of companies. And again, some of the largest patent holding companies in the world uh, and some of the most successful licensing companies in the world, recognizing again that, that the fact that you have a licensing program and you're uh, out, uh, utilizing your patent portfolio in that way doesn't exclude you. It doesn't create a this sense of mutual exclusion from actively participating in OIN and agreeing to reduce risk by sharing patents that relate to core open source functionality. Um, the automotive sector, um, automotive grade Linux has created a, a sea change in how companies are, are participating in developing technology. Uh, and, uh, and as I said, we can expect that the increasingly uh, platforms uh, that uh, on, on, comp on which functionality uh, resides and applications reside for automotive use will be uh, open source based, whether it be AGL, Android for Auto or otherwise. Uh, Again, a, another group of kind of who's who of large patent holding companies. But again, some of the companies that I mentioned, like the industrials, like Caterpillar, Komatsu and others, Johnson Controls, these are companies that you would have never expected 10 years ago, even five years ago, to be, uh, to be moving and transitioning to being increasingly software centric. But clearly that's, that's their focus. Uh, uh, the energy sector, I think LF Energy is a, is a stake in the ground uh, to indicate that, that uh, whether it be gener power generation, distribution, uh, grid management, that, uh, that energy companies are increasingly coming to look to re-architect their networks to be able to be more efficient and effective and serve their customers more effectively. Um, the fintech side, um, which we'll talk more about obviously today, uh, the two largest uh, platforms in the world. One is managed by Ant Financial, which is WeChat Pay, and then, uh, or Alipay rather, and then Tencent's WeChat Pay platform. These are, uh, these account for more transactions in, uh, in a day than most uh, other uh, countries experience in a month. Uh, and uh, software, so Sumitomo Mitsui Bank Corporation, one of the hyper banks, there are three hyper banks in Japan. Uh, Ethereum, Blocko, UnionPay does all the clearances for the uh, WeChat Pay and the Alipay transactions. Uh, again, these are massive platforms doing billions of transactions a day uh, on um, mobile mobile device transactions. And uh, so, uh, this is a. This, it's not unusual that these kinds of companies would join OIN because. It's usually the edge where you have the most innovative companies, and uh, and they're they're these non-bank financial institutions are very uh, very passionate and aggressive about utilizing technology to be able to make uh, payments uh, easier and more secure. And financial, I should also mention, uh, which is a spin out of Alibaba, will be going public in the near future. Uh, and uh, Ant is also the largest micro lender in the world, which is very significant uh, because they were, they were distributing capital to many countries in Africa uh, and to uh, India where traditional banking 
uh, systems will not serve uh, micro lending needs. Uh, but Ant is out there, I think, setting it, being a trailblazer in this, uh, this important area to be able to ensure that capital is available to support entrepreneurship of all, of all stripes in, in many different parts of the world that are typically unserved um, by, uh, in terms of capital needs. Uh, one thing that I wanted to now introduce is this, the, where we are kind of in financial services and banking and, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, what we try to do is monitor, uh, where patents are that are being used that are potentially threatening to the open source community that read on open source uh, functionality. Uh, and understand and support companies that are at risk or in litigation in uh, financial services and across technology sectors. Um, and so um, over the, the last uh, year and a half, we've started to see a rise in PAE, so patent assertion entity. These are non-practicing entities that own patents and, and that often acquire them from operating companies how their activities are shifting to focus more attention on uh, open source functionality uh, in either litigation or pre-litigation assertions. Uh, and, uh, and also how operating companies are becoming involved uh, in, uh, in asserting patents. Um, and uh, Wells Fargo, PNC, ADP, uh, these are all entities in financial services that have uh, experienced uh, litigation uh, in, uh, in the recent past. And uh, in the case of Wells Fargo, uh, they were sued by USAA uh, and uh, USAA is also sued PNC. Um, and this is uh, not necessarily a purely open source functionality issue, but it's indicative of the fact that litigation in an, in an arena that's not, that doesn't often have a lot of litigation, especially since the Alice ruling, which has really limited the, the opportunity space for uh, patent assertion entities to sue, uh, uh, financial services companies in particular. Uh, USAA is an operating company, largely in insurance, uh, that uh, has some patents that read on uh, uh, the functionality related to the image capture of a, uh, of a check and then the remote deposit via electronic networks, in the internet. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this is pretty broad based functionality in terms of its use. And so uh, we can expect USAA will be suing a number of other financial institutions after it uh, moves beyond P uh, its PNC suit. Uh, but it's indicative that this is a community that we can expect more activity and, uh, and more kind of squarely focused open source uh, functionality being targeted. Um, even though this is, a, this is a, I use this as an indicative sign of the future and it's not squarely uh, open source related at this point. Um, what we see from intellectual ventures and sound view innovations to patent insertion entities Intellectual Ventures, perhaps one of the best funded patent assertion entities, and Soundview, one of the most active uh, litigants in the market. These are, these are entities, Soundview has a series of patents that's used over the years against financial services community and beyond uh, that read on Hadoop uh, functionality and uh, or claim to read on Hadoop functionality. And uh, and so, uh, you know, we obviously understand that Hadoop is incredibly important to uh, cloud providers um, and uh, OIN has, in, has included it in its Linux system definition quite recently, uh, along with uh, additional Kubernetes and Kafka functionality. And, uh, and so we're very concerned about, uh, about ensuring that the patents uh, that are held by Soundview have a minimal impact on, uh, on open source uh, choice and functionality uh, uh, implementation. Intellectual Ventures has a series of patents that cl are claimed to read on, uh, on Hadoop, on Kafka, and also on Kubernetes. So the, this area is one that I think uh, 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 that we can expect uh, uh, you know, these, these significant players to be more active in. 
Um, and uh, we have this early warning sign now, but we can expect that companies that own uh, blockchain patents, because there are many small to medium sized companies, as well as groups of aggregators that are for being formed now uh, to try to bring together uh, critical mass of patents. We can expect that these entities and potentially operating companies here and there that own blockchain patents uh, can be uh, potential patent threatenors, aggressors, uh, and uh, be involved in actual litigation uh, beyond just pre-litigation assertion. Uh, OIN is, as I described earlier, is in a, the middle of a pivot right now. Um, we co-founded, uh, we recognize that we were largely set up to focus on operating, on operating company risk. As I said, this monolithic threat that existed, but now Microsoft has recognized this, these levels of interdependency and need is a great driver toward pragmatism. And, uh, and so it's behaving, as I said, in an exemplary fashion as a citizen of open source. Uh, and we're hopeful that that continues and they understand that that's something that's measured by time, not by one event or two events or 10 events even. But anyway, with Microsoft being part of the community, the OIN community and agreeing to neutralize the risk from its patents against open source, um, as defined by the OIN Linux system definition, they are actively in, uh, there are many, many companies that are, um, that are uh, selling patents to non-practicing entities, having those patents utilized. As I said, this is privateering. Um, and so patent assertion entities have lots of patents, some of which read on open source functionality. And uh, if they have them, their goal is not to use them to support products because they don't have products. Their activities are designed to generate a maximization of return on the investment they made in acquiring those patents. So they're out suing or trying to get licenses short of, short of having to sue. Um, what we are doing is rec recognizing that we need to be functional against PAEs and not just focus our attention on operating company risk because operating company risk is declining, although still exists. Um, what we wanna recognize is this reality of PAE activity. And as part of this, last November, uh, we, uh, entered into uh, an agreement to co-found the open source zone uh, that Unified Patents maintains to challenge open source focused patents held by patent assertion entities through IPRs, uh, as well as the collection of information and uh, crowdsourcing to identify prior art through Unified. So a number of things that Unified does. And in doing so, we partnered with Linux Foundation, IBM and Microsoft, uh, and I think it's very important that IBM and Microsoft came together uh, to support this as well as the, as the LF recognizing, all three recognizing the importance of neutralizing uh, non-practicing entity risk. And so we are funding that and uh, supporting that together. Um, we also at OIN have an active pre-issuance program. Uh, it's uh, quite likely, uh, these, done, these are done anonymously, but it's quite likely that we're among the top five, if not the highest filer of pre-issuance submissions over the, the last five years. Uh, and uh, what it does is allow us to reduce claim scope or encourage a patent examiner to reject out of, out of hand a poor quality patent application. We look every week at new patent applications when they're published and then identify prior art from the community, work with the open source community to identify prior art, to make sure it's available to the patent examiner so that, that he or she can, can, again, reject or at the very least reduce the claim scope of uh, patents that read on open source functionality in some form or fashion. We also source prior art on a regular basis to provide to uh, open source entities uh, that are in risk or in litigation, uh, those of you, uh, who uh, saw um, last year about this time, there was a, it's a little earlier as October of last year that uh, a patent assertion entity uh, called Rothschild sued Gnome. Uh, we started working with Gnome uh, just days after the filing uh, and, uh, and were uh, fortunate to be working with a great team. Uh, Gnome put together a great council relationship uh, to be able to support uh, the, uh, 
uh, the negotiation of a, of a very effective community-based settlement uh, with no fees being exchanged. And so I think that was a great win. Uh, we, were, we provided a, uh, the, the content to council uh, to be able to ensure that they could defend Gnome in the most effective way possible regarding uh, prior art uh, and, uh, and help, help to be able to be a part of the uh, of the 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 the, uh, the ultimate outcome, uh, but again, uh, the leadership at Gnome deserves a tremendous amount of credit, as does external counsel, for being able to get to the result that they got to for the community. We've also forward deployed patents. I used this term before. We put patents in the hands of companies that were being sued by patent aggressors. Uh, several years ago, we sold patents to Salesforce to allow them to counterclaim and to limit the damage from uh, patent assertion by a company that uh, was seeking to prey upon Salesforce's lack of patents at that particular time. Um, and it's, in, it's perceived inability to defend itself. We allowed them to defend themselves as an equal in that, uh, that litigation and it was rapidly settled after we conveyed patents to Salesforce. We also uh, have been involved and more recently involved in the use of Cypher, which is an AI tool for patent uh, portfolio analysis um, that allows us to map open source patent holder uh, holdings uh, to see who, who owns, pat who owns uh, open source related patents and uh, whether they, re they represent, what level of threat they represent uh, to key projects. And we do this on a project by project basis. We started with Linux, we then go to AGL, ONAP and many, many other projects to look at risk uh, to those projects of patents held by uh, non-practicing entities and operating companies. The Linux system uh, definition, the cross license scope, the way this generally works is that we, uh, we look at foundations like the Linux Foundation, Eclipse, Apache, OpenStack, OpenAtom eventually, which is the Chinese foundation that was announced a few months ago. Um, we look at projects that are managed under those, by those, those foundations or organizations. Uh, and we look at the core code that's uh, produced uh, in releases. And we evaluate that uh, through our, uh, from a legal standpoint, we look at the, the, the importance of it. Uh, we look at the utilization of it. So from a, a product standpoint, where is it being used? How is it being used? Uh, and then we, uh, um, we include uh, the, that which is being used, which is deemed to be core in the Linux system definition. And that helps us to develop a, um, uh, a patent no-fly zone. Uh, and it, it helps us to stay up with where, where Linux and other open source uh, projects are going and ensure that we're neutralizing risk related to those projects. And this collaboration, we, we, the collaboration that occurs on the technical side is paralleled with what happens on the legal side. We work with the open source uh, legal community on a regular basis to make sure we're up to date uh, on, uh, on you know, what should go into the, what the issues are, who's having problems with potential antagonists, uh, and uh, make sure that we can intervene to be able to uh, neutralize risk. But also it's very important that we have this open line of communication to identify what's core open source code, and then to have it evaluated by our eight member uh, OAN uh, technical committee, and then our 12 member uh, Technical Advisory Council, which is made up of companies uh, that are ordinary licensees that give us a broader view and help us vet more effectively. Uh, we look at uh, Linux and open source projects, and, and these are some of the key ones that we follow and protect, but there are many, many others that we also protect. And we look at the trajectory of these projects and when they're really producing very significant amounts of code and when, uh, when we need to be engaged to be able to support the protection of non patent non-aggression in those areas. Um, this just gives you an example of, of the origins of some of these packages, I mean, the various projects that I mentioned, but many others that beyond the ones that I highlighted that we're protecting. Uh, this is kind of functionally where the packages come from. 
There's a lot of reuse in open source, obviously. And so common base packages represent the most significant component. But over time, we've moved beyond just networking and uh, to include mobility. Uh, we've moved beyond the enterprise to include networking, security, mobility, cloud computing, the web, uh, and are continuing to evolve. Uh, the, the reasons people join uh, OIN, it's free. So it's one of the key components. There's no, no cost for to anyone other than the obligation to be able to engage in the effective cross license uh, that, uh, that we require and to practice uh, non-aggression against uh, others on code that is core uh, from major projects. So we, re we, we reduce risk, we, uh, we, we look at what's being adopted um, and ensure that what's important to you as a company is what's important to us. Uh, as I said, no monetary cost. We do this defensive support work that I described, what we did for Gnome and we've done for many, many other companies over the years. Uh, and at the as a bottom line, and this is something that, that was very resonant with, with Microsoft when they approached us about signing the license is that it's, there's a sense of authenticity or litmus test with 3,300 plus members uh, in our community and some of the largest patent holding companies in the world, as well as some of the most innovative and creative small companies in the world. Um, the OIN's participa OIN participation is really a litmus test of authenticity. And it's something that aids in, in very many ways in being able to hire and retain the best, the best talent uh, that really are, people want to work for authentic companies in this community. They have a a, uh, a uh, moral compass that leads them to a place where, uh, where they want to be and where they want to work because talented people have choice. And, uh, and I think uh, you know, everybody wants those, uh, the, the talented, most talented coders to be part of their team. Uh, ultimately, the only companies that don't sign the OIN license and agree to, to participate in the community uh, are those that wish to reserve the right to sue on core Linux and open source functionality. Now, some companies are have not joined because they're they're un, they want to understand the license, and that's a normal process. But for people who've looked at the license, we've been around 15 years. Most people in open source, where open source is, has had its foundations in the enterprise, and then in mobility and, and networking, understand by now what OAN is. They understand it's free. They understand it's a community service, and they also understand that it's part of a of a set of norms that you adhere to when you're doing what's appropriate within this, the social fabric of this community. And so I wanna thank uh, the, again, the LF and Finos for my, uh, the opportunity to come in here today and to, uh, to speak. And, uh, and I look forward to answering any, uh, any questions that, uh, that might exist from the, uh, the participant uh, viewers. seeing that there are there appear to be no questions unless i'm missing them uh i will uh there are there are questions what are the advantages to non-patented work how do you convince companies to not add patents to work that they are doing how does that conversation go um for companies that don't have a significant amount of money uh, to be able to do a, to publish a disclosure, so essentially to file a patent, and then they can always uh, not go through with the actual registration if it gets granted. Uh, for companies that, that, that don't have the money to kind of go through that process of actually having the patent drafted professionally and filed, um, there are other, other approaches that can be taken. The key is to create patent or non-patent literature um, that can serve as a source of prior art. Pre uh, the, the notion of defensive publications, which uh, uh, IBM is probably the, the leader in this by far over history. Um, IBM produces thousands of defensive publications that it hosts on a site that's managed elsewhere uh, uh, that uh, it's ip.com. 
And that's a very uh, good way because that, that uh, repository sits on the desktop of, uh, of uh, patent trademark office uh, examiners. And so they, when they do their searches, patent literature is always the most important thing. But then they start to they look at non-patent non literature as well. And so that can be uh, influential. So it's not only, um, patenting is not the only way to get at this and, and uh, defensive publications are very inexpensive in relative terms to pursuing a patent uh, program. But there are many, many companies now that come to us that, that tell us that they wanna have a defensive portfolio. I think Red Hat's a perfect example. This is a company that, that's pledged its patents. It would never use its patents against the open source community. Um, but nonetheless, it has a very significant and important portfolio to allow it to defend itself and its customers. And so I think there are examples of companies that have done it uh, that way, that have had the resources to do it that way. And there are examples of companies that, that will publish uh, through defensive publication means it's essentially a patent, the summary of, a, of an invention without any patent claims. Uh, and that's what a, you know, it's a much briefer, briefer document, but again, it serves as a statement of prior art as well. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much. It's uh, been a pleasure to be here with you today and I appreciate the, your time and attention in, uh, in attending the session. Bye now.